let's uh, let's refresh this tech. Um, technique says, okay, we've got products of the sine, products of the cosine, um, and the sines and cosines are maybe raised to power and. In particular, one of them is maybe raised to an odd power. <laughs> so you can sign to the fifth We learned a technique for dealing with these odd powers. And it was to take the odd power. I mean, in this case, there's only one odd. The five is odd. And adjust it a little. Of course, we've got the sign to the fifth. We can't change that. But the sign to the fifth is the sign to the four times the side. So we take the odd power and we factor one out and turn it into an even power. And our goal in all of this is to do a U substitution. In this case, it's going to end up be with U as the cosine of atoms. And the point of taking the odd power and pulling it out is so that when you do this U substitution, you get the DU. If we're going to let U be the cosine of X, we're going to need DU to be the negative sign of x dx. So in particular, we need the sign by itself. We don't want the sign to the fifth. And that's the point of taking this um, sign out of the odd power of signs and pulling it out. But if we're going to let u be the cosine, We've got this even power now. That's why odd is significant. We started with an odd power. We pulled the sign out. Now we have an even power. And we saw that trick on Tuesday. Tuesday, when Monday that an even power can be written as a square raised to a power. <laughs> so like the fourth power is the sine squared squared. And then we use the Pythagorean identity. And we turn, in this case, the sines to the cosines. So if we were, I guess we might as well actually finish out this problem. One minus the cosine squared of x squared times the sine of x times, I want to say it was the cosine squared, and I'm right. And at this point, we have all cosines except for this sine, which we carefully preserved. And this is going to let us do 
this substitution <laughs> and finish out the problem. We're missing a negative sign, but that's not a real issue. We've missed many negative signs before and been able to work our way through it. Let me put this in parentheses so it doesn't look like subtraction. Um, negative one minus u squared squared times u squared du. And once you get this trick down, because I mean, it's all, it's very mechanical. Grab an odd power, pull something out, right? Rewrite it as a square, and then use the Pythagorean identity. Once you get this process down, it's um, mainly the algebra that's annoying more than the calculus. You see, we've got to simplify this, one minus two u squared plus u to the fourth times u squared u. And now we still have to simplify this. I mean, so far, perhaps this is clear, but just so we're definitely on the same page, I took that expression and I foiled it out. So now we have negative u squared, this. This is distributing over the parentheses. Minus two u to the fourth plus u to the sixth du. And now we proceed, I guess. Um, now let's take it to the next frame. So maybe not the pink, not sure that's the most visible color. So negative u squared, this negative sign is also going to distribute. So negative u squared plus 2u to the fourth. minus u to the sixth equals negative one third u cubed plus two thirds u to the fifth minus one seventh u to the seventh plus c. And we let you be the cosine here. This is negative one third, the cosine cubed of X. Plus two thirds cosine to the fifth of X. Minus one seventh. Cosine to the seventh of x plus c. <laughs> and that's the technique we learned from yesterday, the day before yesterday. And I just have a few stray comments. Um, the day before yesterday, so Monday, I said that if you have two odd powers, you can just pick one of them, which is, I guess, formally correct, but was not the best advice I could have given. If both 
the powers are odd. You want to work with the smallest power. So like if we have the sign and admittedly, I've never seen a sign like this in any sort of application, but if you have the sign to the 17th times the cosine cubed of X, then according to what we've said, we need to take an odd power and we need to pull a trig function out. And because there are two odd powers here, there are two ways we could do this, but we're going to run into trouble if we try to do this with a large power. It's better to work with the smaller power. Because let's just see that 17 is certainly odd. So we can certainly go through the steps these problems become rather tedious, but let's fight it. We can pull a side out of that odd hour, and now that 17 is even, it's 16. And that is important because it lets us rewrite it as a square raised to a power. In this case, the square raised to the eighth power. And we've got the sine of X and we've got the cosine cubed of X. And now we are ready to use the Pythagorean identity. And I mean, I used it sort of without comment in the previous example because we talked about it Monday. But remember, the Pythagorean identity is that the sine squared plus the cosine squared equals one. So what I'm doing here is I'm looking and I'm seeing that I have a sine squared by itself. And I'm saying, well, I could take this equality and I could move the cosine squared over to the right. So what I've been doing with the Pythagorean identity is this. And then no real room on the bottom of that frame anymore. But I'm taking this and I'm plugging it in here. I get one minus the cosine squared of X all raised to the eighth. We've got that gray sine of X that we say, and we've got the cosine cube. And now we're basically ready. Um, we're going to again do this U substitution. Just like our first example, really. Again, we're missing a negative sign. That doesn't, again, bother us. We can put ne missing negative signs in. But then we get 
when we do the substitution, one minus u squared to the eighth times u cubed du. And this, this emphatically does bother us. We could theoretically finish out this problem, but in practice, trying to work with this would be so difficult. This is negative. One minus u squared times one minus u squared repeated eight times. And the only way to integrate this polynomial is to do all of this foiling out. And doing this foiling out by hand simply isn't possible. I mean, we could try to do it, but we'd make a mistake somewhere nine times out of 10, and then we'd just be left with an incorrect answer. So this isn't working well for us. I said we should really work with the smallest power. And of course, we didn't do that here. Given a choice between a 17 and a three, I blundered in and tried to use the 17. What happens? If we take this advice that we have written up here and messed around with the three instead. Now, this sign to the 17th, we'll just leave alone. This odd power of the cosine will turn into an even power when we pull it out. We get to skip a step here. Um, I mean, the cosine squared is already what we need. If this were like the cosine to the sixth, we'd have to rewrite it as the cosine squared to the third, but there's no rewriting to be done here. We can just take this with the Pythagorean identity. And now, if we let you be the sine of x and du be the cosine of x, then this is u to the 17th. We've got that large power. We've got one minus u squared. And we've got a du. Um, this, this sine to the 17th became our u to the 17th. One minus sine squared became one minus u squared. And this 
cosine of x dx became du. <laughs> and the thing is that even though, I mean, this at first blush maybe looks worse, we've got that really big power, we've got that 17 in it. But now, I mean, we just take this u to the 17th and we distribute it. And we have this really easy integral that we can take without having to do all of that hideous algebra we were looking at previously. This is 1 18th u to the 18th minus 1 20th u to the 20th plus our constant of integration equals. And u was the sign here. So one eighteenth the sine of x to the eighteenth minus one twentieth the sine of x to the twentieth plus a constant of integration. So you see that, so, I mean, this was a really extreme difference, just because the smallest power was so much smaller than the larger power. But it's always going to be simpler algebraically to use the smallest power. If you've got two odd powers, and you can make a choice. Um, I would like, okay, obviously this week's been weird. Um, I'll finish up this section. Um, so I guess this is kind of a digression, but I'll finish up this section today. Homework and or, and or quiz, homework slash Quiz has not been posted yet. I've been sick. I haven't written it. I'll get it up at some point, but also the test is get, getting out tomorrow. So tomorrow you'll take the test. That will obviously be what I want you to focus your attention on. This homework and quiz will get have a due date sometime next week. So just getting that out there. And with, I guess, about 25 minutes left, I guess it makes sense to at least ask the question. What if both the hours are even. And the answer to this question is nothing good, I have to tell you. Like, I don't know what you thought about the material we did Monday, but it was definitely, uh, definitely sort of the simpler case. If both powers are even, then you hit them with some trig identities. And unlike the Pythagorean identity, which you really should just know, these are not trig identities that I would necessarily bother memorizing. I mean, to address the the elephant in the room, I appear to be copying them out of my notebook. So I must never have bothered committing these to memory. 
but there are these trig identities that let us work with squares of the sign and squares of the cosine. And these trig identities in terms of integration are both simplifications. We don't know how to uh, integrate the square of the sign. We can integrate one minus the cosine of two x over two with O. In fact, maybe this is something it would be genuinely good to see. <laughs> How this identity can help us. If we just have the square of the sign by itself, no cosine to complicate things here. Well, the sign is being raised to the second power. Two is not odd, so we um, we cannot proceed using the trick that we just learned. I should. I will pause a moment here to say, if we had the sign to the fifth of x, the trick we just learned would work. I know I phrased it in terms of powers of sine and cosine being multiplied together, but it also works if you just have a single odd power by itself. But two is not odd. So that trick we just learned isn't any use to us. On the other hand, the sine squared of X is one minus the cosine of two X. <laughs> All divided by two. And this second integral, I think when you look at it, it looks intimidating. Like you've got division and you've got a two X. You don't know how to integrate the cosine of two X. But if you just rewrite this a little, it's one half minus one half the cosine of two X dx. And it might help if you put that two X in the parentheses to help you recognize what's going on. This is an integral that we can take. The one half is absolutely no sweat at all. I should not say things like that in case there are students who struggle with this. I'm not trying to make this seem trivial because it isn't. But the integral of a constant is, a con is the constant times x. So the integral of one half is one half times x. And then we have one half the cosine of two x dx. And the way this is written on the whiteboard, I mean, with the 2x inside the parentheses, 
I hope that you're at least approaching the point where you can see something like this and you can think, oh, this is probably a U substitution. We can try letting U be that little expression inside of the parentheses. We don't have a two, word, but missing constants is nothing new for us. We've been doing this since the end of math 151. Um, let's see. So we want that we've got this one half, first of all. This one half is just sitting there. Then we want a two. So we'll put the two in. But we'll also divide by the two so as not to change anything. And that will give us a second one half. And then, obviously, scrunched right at the edge of um, this frame, maybe, maybe I should, uh, maybe I should go to a new whiteboard frame. So we've got this one half X, it's just sitting there. We've got this two that we're putting in because we need it for U substitution. We've got a second one half that we're putting in because well, we can't just put twos in with e nithy. We don't want to change this integral. And then we've got the cosine. Of two X. Yeah. And all of this is in A of this U substitution, U equals two X DU equals two BX. This one half X just sits around. These constants we don't want, let's combine them first of all. One half times one half is one fourth. And let's pull it out of the integral. Some of you might be thinking this is overkill, by the way. Some of you at this point might just look at the integral of the cosine of 2x and be able to do it in your head. And that's certainly where we'd like to be aiming, but in the mean time, we don't want to leave other students behind. So this is the cosine of U, U. And this whole thing ends up being one half times X minus one fourth times the sine of u plus c. 
And now let's just make the natural simplifications here. We've got the sign of U. What the heck is U? U is 2X. And um, let me see. There we are. Um, sort of an unexpected. This one half x is always kind of jarring to me. I think when we're working with trig functions, we should just have trig functions. But all of this is correct. So we can find the integral of the sine squared. We can find the integral of the cosine squared using a very similar process. If we then have products of the sine squared and the cosine squared, things start to get messy. We're certainly not going to be able to finish this, but that's okay. Let's just briefly investigate. What if we had this integral? And the answer, I mean, we would start in maybe the way you'd expect. We'd rewrite the sine squared. And we'd rewrite the cosine squared. And that one half, um, and that one half, the two one halves, we can pull both of those out. And we get one minus the cosine of two X. Times one plus the cosine of two X. Uh, well, I knew this was going to be ugly when I started doing it. This, uh, this, this actually foils nicely, stuff cancels here. It foils nicely as one minus the cosine squared of two X dx. And it maybe doesn't look like we've improved our life here, but we went from having two squares to one square. It's certainly an improvement. And we don't know how to integrate the cosine squared. That's sort of what all of this is for. So we're going to hit it with this again. The cosine squared of 2x. If we replace x with 2x, we replace x with 2x there as well. 
So it's one plus the cosine of four X over two. Is that uh, clear to everyone? I know these trigonometric identities, you burn them whenever, and then sort of years pass and it all fades. Um, one minus one plus the cosine of four x all divided by two. This simplifies if you want it to. This is one half minus one half the cosine of four x dx. And now I won't finish this out, but you can see this is basically going to be taken exactly the same as this integral was. Um, instead of 2x, we have a 4x. So there's going to be, when we do our little substitution, we'll be letting u be 4x. But otherwise, this is an integral that we can take. So the sine squared, the cosine squared, um, and the sine squared times the cosine squared, all sort of ugly, they're kind of manageable. Um, probably that's as deep as we want to go on this. I always think what are, what are students going to remember three years from now? And I think, well, probably not integrating sine squared times the cosine to the fourth. I'm not sure that I think that's a huge priority. So with that, um, you'll get your test tomorrow and then you can leave. If there's not going to be a supplemental lecture, but you do have to come in and get it. And I will see you then and next week, hopefully more normal than, uh, than this week was. And as I say, quiz will go up when I can, it's not my biggest priority. I'm trying to get back up in all my passes.